Yeah, there's a handout making its way around the classroom. So uh, please take one. And the first thing you're gonna see on the screen is the top part of that handout, the separation of powers. You may recall that in our last class meeting, we were discussing the way the constitution allocates governmental power. The constitution, I learned it in law school this way, the constitution divides up governmental power horizontally across three branches of our federal government. That's the horizontal allocation of power. And sometimes I even on the test, I ask about the horizontal and the vertical division of governmental authority, horizontally across three branches of our national government, and then vertically between two levels of government, our federal government, which is our national government, and state governments. So two governments on top of one another, hence vertical, horizontal. Everybody follow? Horizontal separation of powers and vertical separation of powers. Let's see. I press the right buttons here. We should be in business. I wanted to illustrate the horizontal separation of powers. That's this. Three branches of government Three, it sometimes said co-equal branches of government. Right, I know it's a little, it gets darker in this classroom every, every time we meet because the, it's uh, daylight a little bit later every day. But uh, forgive me for uh, not having a brighter classroom, but I do want you to see this. Uh, and this uh, simply maps out the powers that each branch has vis-a-vis -vis the other branches. Madison. Um, sort of the architect of constitutional separation of powers, talked about how important it was for each branch to have a check on the other branches to prevent the improper accumulation of power into any one of these three branches. We don't want uh, a Supreme Court that rules um, in an authoritarian fashion over our society, making laws, executing laws, and interpreting laws. We don't want any branch having all of those functions. Instead, each branch should stay in its own lane, so to speak. And the Constitution equip equips each branch to uh, resist the encroachments of the other branches, to, to, to quote Madison, resist the encroachments of the other branches. So you see, um, uh, for example, uh, Congress wants to legislate in a way that takes away presidential authority under the Constitution president can veto that bill, prevent it from becoming law. In other words, to protect himself, to protect the executive branch of government uh, from congressional encroachment. Uh, Congress has a lot of tools, the legislative branch, Congress has a lot of tools in its arsenal to resist the encroachments of the other branches. Congress can impeach a president and remove him from office. Congress can defund the entire government. Presidents, you know, every year make budget requests of Congress. Congress doesn't have to act on those requests. Congress can refuse to appropriate money uh, to executive branch functions. If Congress doesn't, by the way, the way, get ready for this in the new year, right? If Congress is unhappy with the president, Congress can uh, use its power over the purse uh, to defund presidential initiatives. So uh, expect a lot of budget politics with the new Congress, most likely. Um, it, it comes to a head. Congress very rarely passes any laws anymore. What they do is spend money, and that's how they legislate. <laughs> Legislation by appropriation is essentially what Congress does. So budgetary politics takes on a huge important in, importance in today's government. Of course, we know, uh, we've talked a little bit about Judicial review, certainly in your reading, you've got judicial review uh, articulated for you as a, as a concept. Uh, very, very briefly, what is judicial review? Anybody have a sense of what that means? Who's reviewing what? The judges, yeah, the, specifically the Supreme Court, although all judges engage in judicial review, but the Supreme Court's ultimately uh, the final word on it. Uh, what what's, what are judges reviewing exactly? 
the latest news headlines. <laughs> uh, reviewing a restaurants uh, in the DC area, well, maybe, but uh, I mean, we're watching the Supreme Court pretty closely right now. They've got some important cases that they're hearing this very week. Uh, yeah, um, Allison? Cases, yeah, cases about what? Uh, in, in the case of judicial review, what kind of cases are we talking about? Law cases, yeah, what's, what law specifically? What source of law? The Constitution, yeah, constitutional cases. What's the question usually in a constitutional case that the Supreme Court has to decide? Is it constitutional? What is it? If you put that on the test, I would circle it. Say, what is it? What, what is it? What's the it? The decisions made of the other branches. Yeah, the laws passed by Congress, uh, executive actions. And the Supreme Court and today's government is fully prepared to tell the other branches You've acted illegally, you've acted unconstitutionally. So that is, of course, the most important tool in the Supreme Court's arsenal when it comes to protecting its own independence, number one. If the other branches conspire against the independence of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is likely to say you've acted unconstitutionally because the Constitution itself secures our independence from you, political actors. But uh, uh, any, any kind of law that exceeds the authority of government, that violates basic civil liberties, the Supreme Court can say that's unconstitutional, it's null and void. The president acts beyond his authority given to him by Congress. The Supreme Court can say that action is illegal. It's happened to President Biden a couple of times. It happens to every president, right? Not picking on him. Um, uh, the statistics suggest that the president is losing in Supreme Court more and more and more and more over the years. The Supreme Court, in other words, is willing to tell presidents you've acted unlawfully. That's a, that's a powerful, powerful thing in our system of government. It's, it's unique. To have a court that will, is willing to stand up to a powerful executive official like the president and tell the president, You've acted unlawfully. That is a remarkable feature. That is constitutional government in action, isn't it? And uh, these countries that lapse into authoritarian uh, authoritarianism uh, usually do so. Venezuela is a great example when the executive undermines the independence of the judiciary. That usually means the end of a republic, the end of constitutional government, the end uh, to limitations on the powers of government and the end of civil liberties. Questions about separation of powers, checks and balances. This is what you have, top half of your handout. Madison, Federalist 51, makes the case for checks and balances. He says, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. In other words, we can expect these branches of government to want to exercise their powers. <laughs> That's just what people in, that have power do. They use it. They tend to use it. You're kind of crazy if you don't. So they may not respect the niceties of the written constitution voluntarily, just as uh, you may not respect the, the class policies in the syllabus voluntarily, just because it's written in the syllabus, that does usually not enough for people. There has to be some force that resists the lawlessness, the potential lawlessness of the other parts of government. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Well, I want to be powerful too. So if you're taking, trying to take power away from me, I'm going to use my power to resist you. So the, the, the friction, the interplay that is built into our system of government is still very much there as a noticeable feature of our federal government. Madison gives the famous um, uh, quote here. Yeah, let's see. Well, I've, I've, I've taken it out. I've taken the most famous part of this out. I, you know, how's that for effective teaching? But if men were angels, uh, no government would be necessary. It's sort of a point we've, we've returned to quite often in, in our class. 
Um, I guess I counted on myself to remember that. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. But what about the men, the people who staff the government? Are they angels? Do they become angels simply because they've been elevated to a position of governmental responsibility? <laughs> hardly, <laughs> hardly, except the people who lead our government. They're all awesome, right? No, they're not. They're flawed human beings, just like we are. And you, you, com you combine a, a Norman, normal human frailty with power, and what do you get? Potential tyranny, a not so angelic government. So since the people staffing the government will be flawed humans just like us, for the same reasons we need law to govern our society, we need a law to govern government. We need a law to govern. And Madison says it basically checks and balances is the law to govern government. Uh, it's, it's, it's a feature of our government that empowers one part of government to resist the other parts of government so that we have a chance at least to stay free. A chance. Not guaranteed, nothing's guaranteed, but we have a more likely, uh, a more, more of a probability of success than um, under a system where the branches don't resist one another. You must first enable the government to control the governed, give the government sufficient power to regulate society for the sake of freedom, as we've discussed so often, and then oblige the government to control itself. <laughs> Built-in self-control mechanisms for the government. Uh, so there's Madison elaborating on the importance of checks and balances. Remember that the critics of the Constitution originally said the powers of government are not separated enough. The branches are not separated enough. There's too much mingling. All these arrows on the diagram. Madison says there's a point to that, checks and balances for the sake of separation of powers, separation of powers for the sake of freedom, keeping government under control. See how that works? Checks and balances for the sake of separation of powers, separation of powers for the sake of freedom, which is the end goal of our constitutional government. Questions here? Now for federalism, the last point in the lecture that we're dragging into today's class meeting from last Thursday. Well, it seems like a long time ago, last Thursday, a lot has happened. Federalism kind of starts with the idea, this concept of federalism starts with the idea, maybe that's the that the Constitution, we the people in the Constitution, delegate certain powers to create a new government. Constitution creates what we call the federal government, and it delegates powers to the federal government. We often call federal powers delegated powers. Who does the delegating? We do. <laughs> Why do we do it? Because in the theory of our government, all political power starts where? With the people. That's Locke, that's the social contract theory, popular sovereignty. So we, the people, have undertaken to delegate certain powers to a national government. Some of those powers are called enumerated powers. So some of the powers delegated by us to the national government are called enumerated powers. What does it mean to say something is enumerated? I almost thought I had some enumeration in this slip of paper that I pulled out of my jacket pocket. Enumeration of groceries that my wife wanted me to pick up on the way home from work. A list, yeah, a list. A list of things, a list of powers in the case of enumerated powers. So there are specified or listed powers in the Constitution that are delegated to our federal government. We wisely chose not to give the federal government unlimited power. <laughs> oh, just do anything you want to. Make any law that you think is necessary. 
And we got we could have done that, but the founders of our government didn't think that was a great idea. The federal government only needs certain powers. What are they? Let's enumerate them. And when you read the Constitution as part of your assignment out of class, you would have seen Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution enumerates powers. What are some of those powers? Anybody have an idea of what one or more of those powers might be? 